Um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kevin Erb, and I'm with the University of Wisconsin Extension. I want to thank everybody, particularly at this busy time of the year, uh, for manure hauling and farm work, for taking the time out of your day to spend an hour with us discussing manure gas safety, keeping not only yourself, your farmers, your employees, but also your livestock safe as well. I uh, do want to go ahead and we'll advance to the next slide here, Jeff, if we can, to give you a brief introduction to today's presenters. As I said, I'm Kevin Erb with the University of Wisconsin Extension Environmental Resources Center. I'm based in Green Bay, Wisconsin, work with the four higher manure applicators in the Midwest. Joining us in today's presentation are a number of experts from the University of Wisconsin, Becky Larson from the Biological Systems Engineering Department, Cheryl Skolas, who is with our UW Center for Ag Safety and Health, John Shutsky, also with Biosystems Engineering, and Jeff Nelson. And each of us is going to pick a slightly different topic today, focus in on it, and next slide, hopefully give you some practical solutions and ideas to keep you and your employees and your livestock safe. So a basic rundown of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, we're going to be starting off uh, with Becky talking about the basics of manure gases and risk. Uh, refresher for many of you, but for some of you who've never thought about this until the recent instances, this is going to be new material for you. Uh, the second presentation is a review of recent incidences and what we know, uh, presenting some information on what's happened recently the recent deaths and to give you an update on what we do know about that. There's a lot of misinformation out there, so we want to set the record straight here as much as we can. Following up, John is going to be talking about uh, safety and monitoring recommendations. We want to make sure that if you invest in monitoring equipment to keep yourself and your employees safe, that you're choosing the right equipment for the right situation. In previous instances, uh, based on misinformation, people have bought technology that really is not as effective as it should be, gives people a false sense of security. So we're going to be talking, building on what we're talking earlier about the particular gases and the types of monitors and monitoring equipment that you might want to be thinking about. Finally, Jeff is going to talk about emergency plans, response, things you should keep aware of as you encounter some of these situations. Finally, then, we're going to have an open Q&A at the end for folks to uh, give us their questions and for all the panelists here today to respond to those as well. Next slide. So just a couple of quick reminders. It's always best to be in a quiet room without distractions. Next slide. Uh, there is a Q&A pod. You'll see the button down at the bottom of your screen. That is where we're going to ask you to type in uh, any questions you may have of the panelists. We'll be looking at those during the presentation and doing our best to try to answer those. We'll probably be saving some as the end to try, try to keep ourselves on time as well. But questions are definitely encouraged. If you've got a question, something doesn't make sense, chances are one of the other 109 people watching today has that same question as well. Next slide. Uh, we do have the chat window, and uh, we have been asking people to type their name and where they're from in there. And so uh, we encourage you to do that. But just a warning, when you type chat, it's going to be visible to everyone and not just the presenters themselves. Next question. Um, if you're not able to ask that Q&A, if you're on the phone today, uh, or you want to just use your phone and send me an email, uh, my email address is there, and I would ask that you either take a picture of the screen at this point so you've got that, or write it down so that you've got it. Um, that way, if you do have questions, you're not able to use the Q&A, you'll have access to that as an option to send us information and questions as well. Next slide. Uh, we are going to be making a recording of this, and because... Uh, You've registered, you've provided your email address, we'll be sending you out a link to where to find that. Probably won't be available until the end of next week, uh, but it is going to be available free and no charge. I know a number of manure haulers have asked about making it available because their employees are in the field today. We definitely want to do that as well. Next slide. 
Uh, if the webinar does freeze, you got a link. Um, just uh, click on that again to come back in. Next slide. And if you are a manure applicator in Wisconsin, Michigan, or uh, Illinois, and you want level two applicator credit, in the chat box, we asked you to type your name, your ID number if you had it, and the business name so that we can track that as well. Next slide. And just a couple of quick thanks to our extension colleagues here in Wisconsin and around the country that helped promote this today. Uh, the Dairy Business Association and professional dairy producers also sent this out to their members as well, and we do appreciate that. Final slide here then, I believe Jeff um, turns it over to Becky Larson, and so we'll be asking Becky to uh, assume the hot seat here, and we'll go ahead and get started. Once again, we encourage you to use that Q&A box to ask questions as we go through Okay, great. Thanks, Kevin. Um, I appreciate Kevin's help and all the others who are talking here today uh, who are able to put a lot of this information together for you all in a quick amount of time. So I'm happy to share with you what we know. Of course, there's always things we don't know yet, um, but I encourage you to ask questions. I'm going to try to be a little brief with some of this background information so we can talk a little bit uh, more about uh, some of the other information. Um, but I do want to give you some some background into understanding what it is that we might be talking about, um, particularly for those who may not be as familiar with some of the other things. So as Kevin mentioned, my name is Becky Larson. I'm an assistant professor and extension specialist focusing uh, mostly in the area of manure systems. Uh, so I'm sure you've all seen a manure storage before. Here's an example of one that we have at the USDA farm uh, here in Wisconsin. Uh, manure storage is great. It can help us with a lot of things, uh, including uh, environmental and operational issues, particularly in relation to timing of manure applications, it allows us to store manure through the winter. Uh, it allows us to store manure when we don't want to apply when it's raining. Um, so there's a lot of reasons we, we choose to do manure storage. One of the downsides of manure storage, however, is that we have emissions from these systems. Emissions are normal. Uh, as you can imagine, when animals excrete manure, there's a lot of microorganisms present in that manure. And they degrade the manure after it leaves the animal. It's really continuing the process that started within the animal, but it continues after the manure is excreted. Um, the constituents in a manure storage can be very different from one case to another. Um, some places just have manure, just have urine, just have some other you know, runoff, leachate, other things from the farm. Other places may incorporate additional things into their manure storage that they take from uh, off-farm sources. So that really helps us to understand some of the things that may be happening in the manure storage and then again some of the emissions and gases that might be produced. Uh, in a manure storage you typically have anaerobic conditions so not a lot of oxygen um, and that that heightens the activity of certain microorganisms which are more active in those conditions. Uh, when you go to empty a manure storage agitation is critical particularly when you have a lot of solids. Uh, that way you can break up the crust as you see here, mix some of the things that have settled to the bottom. It's really important as when we pump out, we want typically, not always, we want nutrient concentrations to be similar. Uh, we want to have an understanding of what's going out to fields. Um, and we need to kind of mix some of these things together operationally because we don't want a lot of solids ending up at the bottom of the, of the manure storage. Um, but unfortunately, one of the problems that we realize is that agitation releases a lot of gases. Now, gases are produced throughout storage. And in, a, in a many storage situations, these gases are produced at low levels and they dissipate into the atmosphere as they're produced. There are concentrations that are low existing, but the, the fact that they can diffuse so quickly into the atmosphere brings the concentrations to levels that are typically not at risk um, to many uh, animals or humans. Unfortunately, when we have these, um, when we agitate, sometimes manure can trap some of the gases that have formed within there. And when we agitate, we release this kind of excess buildup. And, and in those cases, we can really increase the concentrations of some of these systems. Uh, so as I mentioned, microorganisms degrade the organic matter. Um, and it produces a number of gases, but maybe some of the four big ones that we talk about commonly for almost all manure systems 
are methane, carbon dioxide, ammonia, and hydrogen sulfide. Um, these gases are produced from uh, almost all systems. I will say there are other gases that can be produced. You know, sometimes we talk about odor causing compounds can be more than 300 compounds we've measured that can be released from here. So there's a lot of things that are produced, but these are the kind of the big ones that people have concerns about. I would say there could be some other concerns if you're bringing off farm sources, um, but I'm going to focus on these ones today uh, because they're common throughout most of the systems. And really, you know, the big one that I'm going to stress is hydrogen sulfide. Um, although all, all of the gases can potentially be a concern, I'm not going to uh, lower your, your, your thinking about them. I don't want you to negate them completely. Hydrogen sulfide is probably the biggest actor in terms of human health concerns that we have on the list of gases that are produced uh, from a typical manure storage. Um, let's see. I, I'm going to talk a little bit about conditions that increase gas production or potentially the risk that you may have to your health when you're dealing with these kinds of systems. So one increase in gas production, if you increase the temperature, you're going to increase mi microbial activity. That means the degradation will occur faster. That means more gas production will occur. Um, in those cases, you can imagine a hot summer day, you may get more gas production during that time. Um, when I talk about dispersion, where all the gases are moving, from the where they're produced and then dispersing it into the atmosphere that's what we really want to have happen but there are conditions that would limit that from happening for example if there's no wind or if it's still or you have an inversion right these are all conditions where you might limit the movement of these gases out of the system now when it's windy that doesn't mean your risk is zero right i'm going to say these conditions generally limit dispersion but that doesn't mean the absence of them makes it safe okay so i'm, I'm going to talk to you about some of these conditions but i will stress to you that as you move later into the presentations when we talk about monitoring uh, after talking to some other colleagues who work more um focus more on air quality they really stress that monitoring is the biggest thing that you want to concentrate on uh, covers. So covers, if I cover manure, that includes a natural crust, a permeable or impermeable cover. When I say permeable, I might mean a biomass cover. Maybe I put some straw out there or something. That means gas can flux through there, but that there is some retention of gases using that cover. And then impermeable covers, which have no gas flux, can really retain some of these gases. So when you have some of these covers, you're, you're really built, you have the potential to increase the buildup of gas within the, the storage, leading to situations like agitation when you disturb that cover that may release more of the gases. Uh, distance from the source is important. Obviously, the farther away you get, the more chance the gases have to disperse. I will say it's very hard to predict some of these things. It's something we're discussing at this moment about looking at what kind of distance away you might need to be to reduce something related to risk. At this moment, we don't have concrete numbers for you. Penn State has done a little bit of work looking at hydrogen sulfide production in terms of when you're adding gypsum or high sulfur levels. And even at you know, 33 feet away from the pit, they show that there are concentrations that could be concerning. So at this point, we don't have hard recommended numbers, but as you move farther and farther away from the pit, obviously, um, the, the risk will decrease. Um, the other thing you need to think about, again, I'm going to mention the constituents of the, of the manure uh, and how that impacts the gases that are produced. And I want to, go, again, go back to hydrogen sulfide. When we talk about hydrogen sulfide, it's produced from sulfur, right? There are a lot of different ways sulfur ends up in manure. We feed animals sulfur. It's necessary for their, um, their biological activities, and then it's excreted. Now, there are certain additives, feed additives, other things we can use that increase that sulfur level beyond what the animal needs. And then that leads to really high levels of sulfur and, um, and when they excrete. And so those kinds of things can increase the sulfur levels to points where um, the, the sulfate reducing bacteria, which produce hydrogen sulfide, uh, they are more active and they can produce more hydrogen sulfide in some of those scenarios. So, uh, it would be a recommendation if you're having uh, issues with hydrogen sulfide, particularly 
I would stress again the monitoring. Start with the monitoring. It's probably the cheapest, most effective way to understand your risks. If you continue to see that there's some issues with hydrogen sulfide being produced at your facility, you'll want to look at things you're feeding, things you're adding. Look at your manure concentration, sulfur, you know, where are we at compared to some other standards. We're going to try to get a document out so you can compare some of these numbers shortly, hopefully in the same location that we provide this um, particular uh, webinar afterwards so that you can use for comparison, but understanding that those things are key to controlling some of these situations. Uh, I will mention um, some folks want to look at maybe reducing their risk, things that they can do to reduce that risk, and many have asked about additives. Uh, I will say additives, um, we've done some work in studying some of them. Uh, some have shown to have little to no impact. Some have shown some levels of impact. Again, I would stress, although additives may seem like a way to mitigate some of the risk, I would recommend, again, monitoring. And I know I am being repetitive, but I want this to get into your head. Monitoring is the important thing here. Um, and then if you have problems, additives may be something we want to look at. But I would say there's known additives that uh, do something which they like bind the sulfur. So then it's not available for those sulfur reducing bacteria to produce hydrogen sulfide. Um, and in those cases, you know, you can use some iron compounds and some other things. And I would highly recommend very specific things that are known and have been scientifically proven to limit the production of hydrogen sulfide. Um, that's not saying that there aren't some other additives out there that may not that may be able to do this, but I, if you're going to spend money on those kinds of things, I would target specifically um, those things. But again, the cost of those is probably prohibitive, uh, I would say, and that it's more, uh, again, monitoring, right? I knew you could guess that. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about these gases in particular. Uh, hydrogen sulfide, the reason it's so concerning to us is the low levels of concentrations that can have some impact. You can see on the screen in front of you that the typical background level is very, very low. Uh, there's an odor threshold that also is pretty low, a little bit higher than background. So you can begin to smell it, right? That rotten egg smell. I'm sure you've smelled that before. I would highly, I really want to stress, do not trust your nose, right? What you'll see is then it goes up to like 0.3 ppm, you start to get a headache. You can still smell it. Uh, it becomes very offensive, about three to five parts per million. Um, two parts per million, it can start to affect uh, asthmatics. Um, but at some point, we get this olfactory paralysis, meaning your nose no longer can smell that, right? It's, it's really hindered your ability, and then we really start getting into some dangerous levels beyond that point. So you might think, oh, I don't smell it anymore, it's gone away, but really that's still a concern um, because it can be reaching levels that no longer can you smell it. As we get to high concentrations, we hit levels that will, can do some very serious damage. So at low levels, um, hydrogen sulfide um, is an irritant it can, uh, to your respiratory system. And then at high levels, it can start to cause some very serious uh, issues and then leading um, to death. Ammonia, I will say, was another thing I listed. Um, ammonia also can be a, a hazardous compound. Uh, you can see it starts to have some airway dysfunction at about 150 ppm. Um, it can be lethal once we get into the thousands of P, uh, ppms. We don't, so far we haven't really measured ammonia concentrations leaving some of these things at super high levels. Um, there's other situations in which the ammonia is more concerning around the farm. Um, but I will say, you know, we need, a, we need to do a little more background into this. And so just being aware that it is also a potential gas that can come from these systems. Uh, methane and carbon dioxide are a concern mostly because they're um, something that, that can limit your oxygen intake, right? So it's an asphyxiant. If you have too much carbon dioxide and methane, they can displace oxygen and then you uh, won't be able to breathe. These are a bigger concern. I will say bigger because they still can be a concern. But when talking to most of the air quality experts, they indicate kind of in an open area the chance of there being enough of these to displace oxygen enough to lead to some kind of human health impact is low, um, but becomes more of a concern when you start to get into some place where the airflow is constricted or um, 
uh, that we're having issues with um, like a confined space. Again, I will stress the hydrogen sulfide. We have a ceiling PPM of OSHA occupational standards of 20. Um, and then you can hit 50 PPM for a maximum ceiling concentration of 10 minutes. Now these, these, when we talk about the other exposures, when I gave that chart a minute ago with hydrogen sulfide, that's like an acute reaction. There is definitely some um, potential for chronic exposure to have some other issues. And I will say when we're talking about hydrogen sulfide, uh, sulfide the concentrations we're talking about can be even riskier to children who may be around this. They're, they're smaller, their airways are different, there's lots of things that happen that could actually uh, in the same conditions lead them to more exposure, particularly because hydrogen sulfide is heavy and may build up in areas in low-lying areas. And when children are shorter than you and breathing at a different level, they may get more of that in. Okay, um, I'm, I'm gonna now hand it over to Cheryl to talk about some of the recent incidents. Sorry if I went out a little. Good morning. So I want to just take a few moments and talk about some of the recent incidents. Um, and there's a lot that we can learn. Um, this isn't a new situation, but there's always value in looking at what um, incidents from the past. I'm going to take us back in time to 1990. Um, the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health in 1990 issued a NIOSH alert preventing deaths of farm workers in manure pits. And we've talked a lot about manure pits and in the whole um, scope of manure storage and handling, we have a lot of different types of areas and spaces and, and considerations. So early on in the conversation, we were talking about those confined and closed. And these were two cases um, that in 1989 happened and, and brought to light um, the concern about working in manure pits. So the first case of the two brothers entering that confined space, I included because it was a four and a half foot deep pit. So once again, going back to, you know, these do not have to have great depth to them in these pits, um, but just not enough to get that air quality. There's not the ventilation to them. The second case was one um, that was close to home as um, those individuals got brought to treatment here in Wisconsin. And because it was the, the five individuals in one situation. And as we look at these cases, you're going to notice that it's not only the first person that becomes overcome um, in the situation, but multiple people that go into rescue. So as we get talking about the rescue response, when we don't know what's in there and somebody goes down, it means that our, our next course of action is, you know, to get rescue initiated. Manure pit deaths are what I wanted to, to reference first. And these are our, our spaces. They might be our pump reception pits. They might be other reception pits. And there are a number of these cases that are out there, and I just listed three of the more current ones. Unfortunately, one of the cases in 2015 was a father and son here on a dairy farm in Wisconsin. When you look back at these cases, you know, there's a greater percentage that are toward dairy farm, but by all means, you know, hog farms also have um, concerns in this area, and that's reflected in the July 2015 in Iowa. So when we go, we're talking about pits, you know, looking at is it a confined space, following those procedures. Just the Friday before the incident here in Wisconsin, um, there was a farmer in Michigan and another reception pit situation. It was mentioned that he had been in into this reception pit many times before. And in a number of the cases, that is an item that's mentioned that they have you know, we've gone in these spaces before and nothing happened. That's as Becky kept referring to, it's really important that we continue that monitoring and we use those monitors just because one time you do not get um, any readings and you get out of there perfectly fine. It doesn't mean that the next time one of those factors about either the manure slurry, the system, your activities that you're doing, hasn't changed that air quality in there and it's not able to sustain life. 
I did want to mention the form, foaming and manure pits that you know started in 2009. Um, this is a methane release from that foamy manure. For those of you that are working in the hog industry, you're a lot more familiar with this. Um, we, we've had some barns destroyed, workers injured. This is a result of some of that quick breaking of the foam, releasing that hydrogen, the methane, but also some hydrogen sulfide at that time. So the methane, when we talk about methane and it, its um, dispersion throughout, it also has that explosive concentration. And so when we see the foaming, the foaming, it's a reminder that there is that factor of methane with these foaming pits. I wanted to include the manure tankers and I realized yesterday that it has been 10 years that I have been talking about manure gases and the risk of entering confined spaces after a manure tanker incident here in Wisconsin. And, and we will continue to work with everyone on this and, and to talk about it and to get safety procedures that can help you out. These were a couple of cases that I pulled because they relate to the Occupational Safety and Health, OSHA, and a couple of citations that, that were issued. And it's important that as we grow in our industry here, um, that we recognize that for some of those farms with 11 or more employees, that you, know, you fall under those OSHA regulations. And even if you don't have that employee number, you know, if you have employees, but for your farm family members too, it's important to follow these safety regulations. The second case um, listed there, the October 2015, um, it brought up some important things about hazard communication programs, um, the requiring for monitoring, and respiratory programs, which when John gets into his sections, um, he'll talk about some of those factors more. But look at your farm operation, look at your business if you're a custom nutrient applicator, you know, who has what responsibility for which employee exposures. So the most recent, um, a couple of recent cases here related to open air non-enclosed storages. Um, I'm gonna take us back to May of 2012, and this is a case in Maryland that we do not know a lot about, but I think it's important. These all represent the loss of life um, for the most part. And you know these fathers and sons on this dairy farm in Maryland, they were found um, dead in an open air, non-enclosed manure storage. Um, questions, um, even though the death were considered, you know, drowning and some trauma to them. Prior to that, what caused this? And and so some questions remain around that one. In in September of 2012, this was a case that a lot of us are familiar with as a uh, father found his two-year-old and four-year-old alongside the storage, and Becky mentioned about children being present in these atmosphere. They had just started agitating. Both of these cases really were incidents that started the discussion about gypsum as bedding and sulfur-containing ingredients that may increase the production of hydrogen sulfide. So beyond the gypsum, you know, copper sulfate, um, distiller um, byproducts, you know, water that's high in sulfur. What are those factors that can add in that we could get that greater hydrogen sulfide production? So to our, our most recent and unfortunate case, and you know, one that as, as um, you know, we know the family has, has been kind enough to share um, with the communities the background and the, and the situation, um, this is still an open investigation and um, appreciate that Coroner um, Rifleman from Portage County is on the webinar today and has um, been open in having conversations around this case and we, we look forward to his final um, conclusion on the case um, shortly. So a 29-year-old beef producer um, and 16 cattle died in this incident. Along the right-hand side of the slide, you can see the, the storage unit. And I'm, we're sharing this because a lot of people had a different conception of this incident from some of the, the early reports. Um, so it is a concrete lined um, outdoor and um, non-enclosed storage. This is a beef lot situation with the manure scraped into the storage. The silage leachate pad drains into the storage. Um, at the point of time that this incident uh, occurred, the agitator had the nozzle pointed towards where they found the producer and the pen of animals were 
um, located that had died. That's an important factor when we start talking about where do you set up and that agitator, even though this was a calm wind um, type of situation, that agitator is creating air movement and, and to consider where would it direct the flow um, of these gases. We have confirmed with the family that no gypsum bedding has ever been used on the farm. And I wanna state that from a previous webinar and fortunately with the work in Penn, at Penn State did, they identified that gypsum increased the amount of hydrogen sulfide. They started looking at other sulfur contents. Um, so we just wanna be sure that everybody understands that is not a factor in this case. Well, they, the family has provided um, the ration and we wanna look further at the distiller syrup, which can be high in sulfur. And at this time, um, still some more work to be done in that area. We talked a little bit about weather, typical summer, and we know that morning. So Becky talked about that, that distribution of, of the gases from a space. And you know what are some factors that you need to look at? And again, without monitoring, we can't, um, you can't know what you're going into. This is uh, you know, still an open investigation. Um, we are presuming that hydrogen sulfide played a role and based on some of the information that we've looked at, some of the discussions. And with that, I am going to turn it over um, to John to talk more about safety precautions. Okay, thank you, Cheryl. And I'm John Shutsky. I have been uh, doing this kind of work since 1985, I wanted to say that that was 21 years ago, but I remember today it's actually 31 years ago. So I'm gonna to try to get through my presentation here today without my reading glasses. What I wanna do is to talk about safety and monitoring, and I'm gonna go kind of uh, carefully and deliberately here because the consequences of doing these kinds of actions inappropriately or inaccurately can be pretty catastrophic. Um, First of all, let's step back. Both Becky and Cheryl talked about the issue of confined spaces. And we do need to remember that in agricultural situations, we have a number of confined spaces. Obviously, in a manure storage situation, pits, uh, reception pits like uh, Cheryl talked about, sumps, uh, slurry storage type units, and other tanks, all fit the definition of a classic confined space. That would be a space that has limited ability to get in or out of the space. It's big enough to, for a person to go in. Um, it's not designed for continuous occupancy or I'll say continuous work. And it has a potential over a time period to develop a significant hazard. So obviously when we talk about these gases, whether it's an asphyxiation hazard from carbon dioxide or methane, or obviously, as everybody has talked about, hydrogen sulfide, you do have an obvious potential to develop a significant hazard. I don't wanna spend all of my time talking about confined spaces. Um, it's really beyond the scope of what we can cover in this webinar. There are multi-hour, or in some cases, even multi-day confined space trainings that are available. Um, we're talking about a complex environment that involves regulations, it involves the potential for liability. There are also practical and administrative requirements and needs. Some of these include training and administration, air testing and monitoring, um, ventilation, personal protective equipment, and the sometimes complicated use of life harnesses, uh, cable winch systems, things like that, so that if a person goes into a confined space, and becomes overcome, you have a way to get them out safely so that you don't have these multiple responder types of incidents. The picture on the left-hand side of the slide is actually from a case that I investigated in early August of 1992, so many years ago. Two men went down into this collection area. Actually, the first person went down, became overcome by the gases. There had been a little bit of sloshing around, but they weren't actually pumping. They were just trying to move a pump around down in. We had a double fatality. And then the next day, again, in early August of 1992, we had a father and son who went down under a, this was under a dairy barn, and that was actually on the western side of Minnesota. So these cases do happen. They represent real people, uh, real families, and real individuals. 
I want to talk and focus the rest of my presentation on air testing and air monitoring. And I'm specifically going to be thinking about and referencing this case that just occurred up in Portage County on, I believe it was on August 15th. As I talk, I want to assume, and I want you to assume, that we're talking about a continuously dynamic and changing situation when we talk about these pits, or in the case of the Amherst case, an outdoor environment. I also want you to think about only entering these spaces when you have air movement with wind. And again, as Becky talked about, we can't give you a definitive wind speed number. There are so many different variables, but you do need wind movement. And also the potential, the strong potential to encounter hydrogen sulfide, even in an outdoor setting. First of all, with monitoring, we strongly recommend that people consider the use of a four gas monitor. When I talk about four gases, you can go online, you can go to Amazon, or there are several safety catalog companies that will offer four gas monitors. In a farm situation, we're talking typically about four different components. The first is to measure for the presence of oxygen. With um, any type of breathing situation, you need a minimum of 19.5% oxygen. Many of these multi-gas meters will also measure for the presence of some type of a flammable vapor or flammable gas, in this case, methane. So what they're looking for is to see if you're exceeding a lower explosive limit on a percentage basis. The ones we recommend on a farm, especially, especially if you're talking about a livestock farm, will also will monitor for hydrogen sulfide. And then finally, often you will have the option of what that fourth sensor should be. And we typically in a farm setting will recommend carbon monoxide, not because you see carbon monoxide with livestock manure, but often you do with things like uh, indoor pressure washer or uh, any type of combustion engine or even a potential malfunctioning water heater or furnace or those kinds of things. I have some typical example prices here. I've seen them for as low, for a four gas monitor, as low as $500 to as much as $2,000, maybe even $2,100 for a good quality four gas monitor. I would suggest to you that you ought to be looking with a four gas monitor, typically at spending $750 or so, but that only includes the monitor. That does not include the calibration equipment. And I'll come back and talk about that in a few minutes here. Um, with respect to calibration, service and support is equally important. And many of the companies that sell these monitors, if you buy direct from the manufacturer or a reputable distributor, will provide some of the calibration services at a cost. So the forecast monitor, again, we're talking $750 to $1,000. In the case of the outdoor, um, non-enclosed, non-confined space situation, such as what we recently saw in Portage County, we also are wanting to look at some more practical applications where we might want to look at hydrogen sulfide only, a hydrogen sulfide sensor used by itself and not as part of a four gas monitor. The good thing about monitoring hydrogen sulfide um, as a single gas, quite a bit less expensive. The particular sensor that's shown on this slide, I believe is $99. I've seen the price ranges ranging from a low of 99 to as much as 210 to 250. They come with different features, different capabilities. On the whole, hydrogen sulfide sensors are pretty dependable. Um, the, the mode of operation, it's a pretty simple type of sensor. They don't use a lot of power. They tend to be robust over a longer period of time. In other words, they don't get consumed by the gas that they're looking for. And um, because of all these characteristics, they're, they're pretty good um, types of units. Um, there are some units that you could buy at that lower price end between 99 and 150 where the specifications might indicate that calibration is not required. Um, but there is still something called a bump test, which is typically recommended. A bump test, you simply have a device, you put the sensor on with a known quantity of hydrogen sulfide, and it bumps it to let you know that you're gonna go into an alarm condition if you actually see the gas while you're out working. Again, I wanna just emphasize here slowly, the potential use of a hydrogen sulfide sensor by itself has to include an assumption that you have 
adequate oxygen levels, that you don't have any other toxic gases present, and that you're not inside of a confined, a confined space, and also that you're using it correctly. Um, you need to know that if you purchase a hydrogen sulfide sensor, in most cases, they will come shipped with two alarm st uh, states or conditions. One is 10 parts per million and the second is 15 parts per million. Those are both based on two OSHA thresholds. The lower OSHA threshold of 10 parts per million is based on what OSHA considers to be its time-weighted average, where if you're working in a given location for eight or fewer hours in a day, you can tolerate up to 10 parts per million if you're healthy and if you're wearing the right type of protective equipment and you don't have other types of health conditions. Like Becky mentioned, if you're a person dealing with asthma, even something as low as a part or two per million of hydrogen sulfide can be problematic. That higher level of 15 parts per million is the short-term exposure limit, and that is based on a concentration that you can tolerate for no more than 15 minutes. Again, 15 parts per million for 15 minutes, and those short-term exposure limits are the ones in which you begin to um, experience some more significant health problems like those that are indicated on the bottom of the slide. Irritation, chronic or irreversible damage, and some of the other ones that you see there. Um, I don't expect you to be able to read this slide. What I wanna do in this next section is to just reference briefly, I think what is a really good document that came out of uh, the Great Plains NIOSH Center down in Iowa. And if you're curious, if you want to get a hold of this, I think we'll be able to provide you with the links when we send some material out. If you want to get it shorter term, I have provided a URL at the bottom. Just read this quickly. It's http colon slash slash tinyurl, all one word, dot com, tinyurl.com slash z as in zebra, five, v as in victor, J as in John, B as in Baltimore, M as in Mary, and Y as in yellow. And if you're not a person that's good at writing things down quickly, if you simply search manure identifying hazardous gases, you'll be able to find this quickly on a Google search. It should come up at the top or maybe the second link down. Again, what I want to do, this is about a five-page document. And as we, um, the, those of us that have been involved in this webinar have thought about the Amherst case, we wanted to provide you with some practical guidance. If you're using either a four gas monitor or only a hydrogen sulfide sensor and it's in one of these outdoor ambient air environments. So the first thing from this article, and I've edit these, edited these slightly just for simplicity, and this probably sounds obvious, but you want to make sure as you're probing into a space with a monitor that you are in a known safe location and that you are testing into what is a potentially hazardous or dangerous situation. I again will have to say that based on what we know from the Amherst case and the Pennsylvania cases and some other things that Cheryl has referenced, if you are in a zero or low wind situation, all of those zones should be considered to be highly unsafe and potentially highly hazardous. Um, as you begin to probe into this area, with some of the sensors, it is possible to purchase tubing and a pump that will allow you to pump potentially hazardous air into the sensing unit. We often talk about having um, that tube, if you're probing horizontally, mounted at the end of a four or a six foot stick or a pole, or a piece of thin gauge, like a PVC pipe. The one thing if you're using a pump and a tube, you need to make really absolutely certain that you're allowing for the time lag. That time lag can be 20, 30, or even 40 seconds. If you need to, if you don't have the tubing and a pump, you could also secure the monitor at the end of a long stick, or again, a pole, again, four to six feet, or eight feet if you can handle it probing the space, probing with the monitor laterally. You have to think also if you're securing a monitor to the end of a stick, make sure, making sure you're not covering the sensor unit. You always wanna test 
in the direction that you're traveling or moving. If you're moving horizontally, you're, you're having this pull out in front of you, checking at all levels, checking at least four feet in front and four feet to the side. And again, because of the potential for lag time on these sensors, moving extremely slowly. And I'm talking like literally almost at a crawl. Some other considerations, I think it's important to note that a cartridge respirator like one might use for pesticides and other types of gases, a typical cartridge respirator is going to have zero value if we talk about these high levels of hydrogen sulfide, such as what we saw up in Portage County, which we, we most likely believe that to be the case. The only solution in high levels of hydrogen sulfide is a self-contained breathing apparatus or other type of supplied air respirator. Um, these are limited, costly. There are logistics to using, for example, the air pack that you see on the right-hand side. Getting down into that earlier manhole for the collection pit or the reception pit would be really difficult to wear or to go into with a self-contained breathing apparatus. A self-contained breathing apparatus is absolutely required anytime you get up over 100 parts per million, which is the um, level at which this gas becomes immediately dangerous to life and health. Um, we're also looking a little bit, and we've had some people suggest that you might be able to use an emergency escape breathing apparatus. Essentially, this is like a small form of a self-contained unit. Um, gives you about five minutes of fresh air to breathe. We really feel like more evaluation work is needed. My feeling is that if you are probing an area with an inexpensive or a more expensive, either a one gas or a four gas monitor, and you suddenly go in into an alarm condition, you hit 10 parts per million or 15 parts per million, it's best that you get out. If you suddenly reach 100 or 150 or 800 parts per million, you simply don't have time to stop, unzip your air pack, get it put on, and make sure that oxygen is flowing. So we recommend that you get out when you encounter those kinds of situations. You get to higher ground to an area that is known to be safe, preferably uh, upwind from the source, and as Becky talked about, some distance from the source as well. Anytime that we're using any type of respiratory protection, be it a small scale or a larger self-contained breathing apparatus, it has to be done within the framework of a respiratory protection program. Among other things, that respiratory protection program in includes a lot of training and making sure that you know the limits of this type of equipment. My last comment here is I'm concerned a bit about people becoming, I'll call it dependent on safety devices. You have to know the limitations. If you are out, you're monitoring, or you're probing, you're using a, a set of self-contained breathing apparatus or a monitor, you need to not use that as a replacement for good judgment. Workers must not ignore, dis disable, or stop using monitors. Again, if you're getting frequent alarm conditions, it means you've got hydrogen sulfide gas present, and you need to find a way to correct and or get out of that particular situation. Um, conclusion, monitoring is complex. Four gas monitors are needed definitely in a confined space. A single gas monitor for hydrogen sulfide might suffice if you're working outside around a storage area and you have adequate air movement, but even in that situation, a four gas monitor is still strongly preferred. Uh, proper use, technical knowledge, testing protocols are needed. And then finally, respiratory protection equipment has potentially some value, but it is very complex and it has absolutely no value in the toxic environments, such as what were suggested in the Amherst case. And again, in those cases, you need a fully self-contained breathing apparatus. So with that, it's also important to know a bit about emergency response, preparedness, and rescue. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Jeff Nelson. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hello. Good morning. Um, again, my name is Jeff Nelson. Um, I am a power and machinery specialist here, and I'm also a firefighter, which kind of brings in um, the angle of pre-planning and a little bit of emergency response for, for incidents. Um, up front, just some simple things you can do for pre-planning. Um, 
having not, not only the regular um, warning signs about the potential hazardous gases and, and confined spaces and those things, but even having something as simple as 911 or your emergency phone number and your address posted. Um, it's been shown many, many times when an emergency happens, people go into this fight, uh, fight or flight type of scenario. Uh, cognitive abilities have shown to be reduced. And I've even seen it myself a couple of times where I tell people, call down on one. And they say, okay, what number is that? And they just can't even think. Where having a, a sign posted can, can really help it direct attention. Um, and especially addresses um, for custom haulers where you may be visiting multiple uh, sites. Consider even having a card that you would issue to each of your employees for every site that they're at that would show the address, emergency contact numbers, um, and that kind of information would be very handy. Make sure other people know the schedule um, so that if you're, if you're delayed or you don't, do not return back or check in with someone at a certain point that some more notifications or actions are taken. Uh, time can be of the essence if someone does have an, an incident and getting help to them quickly is, is very important. And finally, even having people trained in CPR. Uh, respiratory issues are a problem with many of these gases and once someone uh, provides, they can be safely uh, retrieved from those areas, uh, having just that, that training can be very valuable. Another step for pre-planning would be to contact your local fire department. Invite them to come out and visit. Uh, many fire departments these days have less and less individuals with direct farm experience and agricultural experience. So simply bringing the firefighters out to your, your scene can be very, very valuable. Uh, it can be very eye-opening for, for some of those individuals to see the kind of equipment and the facilities that you work, you're working with. Gives them an opportunity to see if their vehicles can get in there. Uh, we're so used to our trucks, four-wheel drive, tractors, those sorts of things that can handle pretty much any kind of uh, environment. Your typical rescue trucks, fire engines, squads are pretty much limited to asphalt. A hard-packed gravel can work okay, but if it gets wet, if it gets sloppy, they may not be able to access the areas they would need to. So bringing the department out where they can see it, see the environment, can uh, help them plan and know that if they are brought to your area, maybe they need to bring four-wheel drive vehicles right away. Their, their brush trucks or ATVs, those can be, can be valuable uh, piece of equipment to have on hand quickly. They also may need to involve a hazmat team. Uh, access to a confined space, air monitoring equipment, some of that specialized, um, those specialized tools aren't necessarily always available, especially to small rural fire departments. And for an incident that does involve some of these areas, they may need that hazardous material equipment. And there is some delay potentially getting that on site. So if they know that they have a gas incident um, and a confined space incident, they can request that equipment sooner and um, can help that out. Plus just getting the lay of the land. Uh, a Google map with hazards located and labeled on there can be very helpful. So when they pull in, they know where to go to, to find the different areas. Um, and once you, you do establish a plan, it's also important to keep those things up to date. You know, with uh, all of our electronic calendars we have these days, just put an annual item in there. Um, at some point, uh, maybe a great midwinter kind of downtime activity while you're maintaining your equipment. Hey, double check your annual plans and make sure that everything is current and up to date and everyone has the information they need to. I do want to reiterate and reemphasize about the gas monitoring, especially understanding the sampling rate. Uh, being a firefighter, I've used these many times and has experienced how fast an individual can move, especially when you think there's something going on, the heart rate goes up, you get excited, and it's pretty easy to start running, and you can very quickly move into a hazardous atmosphere far faster than the gas detector is capable of detecting it and all of a sudden you find yourself in a 100 part per million condition by even taking like four or five steps. So um, please make sure if you do get into gas monitoring that you are very um, cognizant of that, that uh, specification. So if there is an accident, uh, a couple things to consider in that respect. Um, number one, when you call 911 or the emergency number, the dispatcher is gonna ask you a lot of questions. Um, you're going to want to go help somebody or take some action, but please stay on the phone, answer those questions, it provides very critical information to responders. 
Um, if it is an incident involving a manure storage facility of any kind, make sure that specifically is mentioned on the phone. Uh, because a fire department to get their gas monitoring equipment turned on, zero it out and ready to go. So when they show up on the scene, they can start monitoring immediately. Um, the more information you can provide them, the, the better the response will end up being. And one of the most difficult things, and I could hardly imagine what this would be like to be there, but if someone does go down and you even see them go down, please do not dive in right after them. Whether it's an open air or a closed facility, um, there's, a very, there's a reason they went down. Um, Without air monitoring, we don't know what it is. Maybe they just slipped and fell and hit their head. Maybe they had a heart attack. Maybe it was bad atmosphere. Um, many documented cases of one individual trying to go in and rescue whoever it happens to be, and they become another uh, a victim. Uh, the best thing you can do at that point is simply back out yourself, call 911, and get some more well-equipped responders on the way. And finally, send someone to meet those responders. Um, depends on where the, the scene is, getting to that may be difficult. You may have to take a special route to get there. Um, if you can escort the responders in, that can help speed up that response quite a bit. And finally, after um, any kind of an accident, as painful as it may be, take time to review why it happened. Um, what were the causes? What hazards are there that can be addressed? Are there any measures that we can take to to fix some of those issues. Are there any procedures that need to be altered? Um, as has been mentioned before, just because things have worked in the past doesn't mean it will always work that way safely. Uh, may need to most certainly make things, it might be more difficult, it might be less convenient to do an action in a certain way simply because it, be, and it becomes more safer by doing that. Um, so taking that time to do kind of a post-action review as emergency responders will often do that after a scene, hey, how can we make this better? How could our response be better? Um, if there's an accident, we most certainly wanna be revisiting that um, and find out how we can make this and prevent this from happening again. And with that, um, that's the, the end of our primary content here. Um, we can potentially address some questions. I know there've been some that have come in on email. Um, Looking to my other. All right, Becky's going to come in and address a couple of questions up front here. And I think we had a well, Becky is getting situated. If you do have questions, you can type them into the Q&A. You can also now, if you want everyone to see them, type them into the uh, chat box as well. Uh, we'll be here for uh, a good 10 minutes or so from this point forward to answer questions that you may have uh, that come up. Uh, as well. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Becky or whomever is going to sit down first here. All right, let me get some. So we had some questions submitted already. Um, there, the first question uh, that we had was, would feeding 30 pounds of wet corn distillers per animal per day or feeding several pounds of a syrup byproduct from the ethanol industry lead to higher amounts of sulfur being excreted in the manure? Um, one of the things is there's a lot of products that can add sulfur into the diet uh, as well as bedding. Um, and if you're exceeding the recommended or the uptake of the animals, then yes, um, you will have additional sulfur being contained within the manure. Um, some of the things I listed there um, that contain sulfate include molasses, corn gluten, um, or distillers grain, solubles, and some other things where they use sulfuric acid or other things which add sulfur to the content of those particular things. You can easily run some tests on any feedstocks you're bringing in regularly just to get an understanding. Um, and within that question, if you're, if you're open to the thing, you can look, and I also provided some information of the recommended um, sulfur requirements um, required, so anything in excess of those uh, will likely be excreted in the manure. Um, uh, Cheryl also had me mention that we're working with some of the UWEX uh, folks from Dairy and Animal Sciences um, who are helping us understand maybe some feed additives that are common and what some of those sulfur um, concentrations are. So hopefully we'll be able to follow up in the future specifically um, with some values concerning some of that. One of the other things that I put up there is if you think about um, that if you do a simple manure test, so 
Um, uh, There have been some who have been looking at uh, all of the manure samples that are submitted to some of the labs in the state over an extended period of time. Uh, And the median sulfur, the median sulfur concentration in dairy manure is 1.9 pounds per thousand gallons. So if you run a manure analysis report and you're getting numbers that are in, uh, you know, much higher than this, uh, you may have some concerns going on with the amount of sulfur in there. I can't give you a pinpointed number at this point as to when you're crossing some threshold of when it will be of concern. Um, when I was looking at some of the numbers, some of the maximum numbers went up to like 350, you know, uh, pounds per thousand gallons. Then I would say you probably have a major concern there. But whether or not 10 or 20 or what number is concerning, um, I don't know that yet. I'm hoping we'll be able to follow up some with some additional simple research to uh, get some more information out to everybody. But at this point, I would say if you're if you're over that median and you're doing some testing, that may be a concern. Um, uh, that you're having excess sulfur in in some of your components that might lead to some concerns. Uh, Another question that we had, um, I'm going to let Cheryl answer the one about OSHA. Um, There was a question that asked if um, they would be interested if anyone has looked into incidents of mortality of livestock and poorly ventilated or dead spots of the barn. Um, I know there have been some incidents of that, even, you know, uh, animals being knocked out. I would say the biggest concern for that is when you have under barn storage. So under barn storage is a concern because those gases are being produced and then can move into the barn where if you don't have enough um, ventilation, then you'll get some buildup in there. I know we've had some concerns with that in the past particularly when you're agitating. So if you're agitating in under barn storage, I recommend you move all of the animals. It's a recommended practice. Every people, animals out of the building while you're doing that. And also ensuring, uh, you know, a lot of ventilate, pit ventilation and ventilation in the barn can reduce some of the issues associated with that. There may be other incidents I don't know about, but I think that the primarily um, those are the concern in the barn is when you have under under barn storage. Uh, oh, like how far it's going to move away from there. Um, there's another question here um, that in addition to concerns surrounding immediate health risks, has there been any research on the effects of repeated exposure and accumulated toxicity of manure gases on longer term health? There has been some work done on that. Um, I included a link there to the ATSDR, which is part of the the CDC kind of maintains that. Um, And and I kind of pasted some text from them. I'm definitely not a health expert, but um, they they do say, so hydrogen sulfide does not accumulate in the body. um, So you don't have to be concerned of it accumulating within you, um, but they do have um, uh, concerns with repeated or prolonged exposure Exposure has been reported to cause low blood pressure, headaches, nausea, nausea, loss of appetite, weight loss, inflammation, chronic coughs, and also some neurological symptoms. So you can look into there. They have some additional resources. And if you have further questions after that, um, we can definitely look into that. Um, I, there's a few open questions. I'll, maybe I'll let Cheryl tackle some of the ones we've already answered unless there's something that popped up here. And I'll... If there's others that just popped in, I will try to follow up with those in a moment. So Becky, don't go too far. Okay. Um, so there was a question that came in. If, if a person has become overcome, if a person uh, dies as a result of an incident, are there tests that can confirm the presence or the that the person was exposed to hydrogen sulfide? Um, the answer to that is yes. Um, I will say that there were cases back in the early 1990s where death was characterized as being due to methane exposure. And I would actually, um, in some of those cases, we've actually asked that they go back and it was in fact hydrogen sulfide. Um, I believe that the the coroner's report on the most recent Wisconsin case up in Amherst is still somewhat pending, but do know that if a coroner or a medical examiner or the people doing the pathology work 
if they know that this involved manure pits or manure pit gases or that people were working around livestock waste generally, there are ways that they can look for the metabolites of hydrogen sulfide exposure. And I believe that that's being done here in this Wisconsin case. There was another connected question. If a response occurs and, and uh, they're transporting a person in an ambulance, they have lived through the incident, they're transporting a person, is that person considered hazardous? Are they somehow off-gassing? And I'm 99% I'm sure that we can find out with certainty, but I have never heard of that happening before. The actual amount that would be in a person's body or hydrogen sulfide that would be somehow connected to contaminated clothing would be so low relative to the space that an ambulance crew is in. I, I just don't ever see that being an issue. Um, Cheryl, other questions? Are you going to come and join yeah, us? Here? So there was a question related, does OSHA apply to the custom manure applicators? And so um, Wisconsin is a federal OSHA state. For some of you that are in other states, you may have um, state OSHAs and, and you need to have that conversation. In checking on this item prior to the webinar here, um, for custom applicators, they would fall under the agriculture standard, the 1928. Um, but some of that, like the, the hazard communication, goes back to the general industry. With that being said, we need to look at that appropriation rider, just like with our dairy farms, that it becomes, you know, the 11 or more employees is where OSHA can um, use their funds to do an inspection and for those general OSHA compliance factors. At the same time, we also recognize the fact that you, as a custom manure applicator, are going on to farms and so there is that um, sharing of employee exposure as I mentioned and so we'll we'll work on on some information that could help you out in understanding that further because it's a little bit um, more than what we'll get to today I think have we answered all the questions no, we have a few other questions okay this one the portion. Okay, we got that one. Um, there was some questions about uh, talking about the issues related to calibration in some of that equipment. I don't know if you just, I was reading while you're answering. Um, but I would recommend that people, there are some single gas monitors that do not require calibration. Uh, I mentioned that in my lab, sometimes we have the four gas monitors. I also require people to use those single gas ones because they operate for a number of years uh, without calibration needed for hydrogen sulfide. We have a lot of experiments running hydrogen sulfide um, in our labs, and so we're very careful. Uh, I feel more comfortable with them having, so in the case that our four gas monitors, those take a lot of work to keep those maintained. Right. Some of right. those single gas monitors are really useful. And, and, and I would really encourage you when you're looking at the, the gas monitoring equipment, you know, to, to talk to someone, you know, either a safety supply company um, ask about their training and, and what support that comes. Look at the length of sensors um, because there's some newer sensors out there that you pay a little bit more for, but they'll last a longer time. And so, but calibration, keeping the equipment up, having a competent person trained who's going to be using it, you know, that all comes back to, to part of your total, um, you know, hazard communications program and what parts those need to play. So there was also a question, um, is, is there information available regarding specific hazards with leachate tanks from bunker storages and gases present, et cetera? Um, I would say we probably don't have specific information for those conditions, um, but what we have seen is that like leachate tanks, things where you don't have a cover, like no buildup, usually the gases can dissipate. The one concern I have over leachate when you say tanks, or other things is if they become more of a confined space, then you may have some issues there. Um, but we, I don't know that we've had any specific concerns with like a leachate tank. I think um, it's still just an area we need right. to be looking yeah, at. But and using the same precautions would yeah. reduce your risk there. Um, so could you address any possible concerns with a residence downwind from the manure storage and handling? Yeah, you know, I was talking a little bit to the air quality folks about this particular question um, and that we're hoping to do a little bit of risk assessment to understand that. Um, at this point, a lot of the 
incident where something has occurred has not been far from the manure storage, usually very close to it, um, which would lead you to think, I, I just, I don't want people to become overly alarmed, but I don't have the data to say that this is totally safe either. Um, there could be conditions where we're seeing uh, concentrations moving past, you know, and if you look at the Penn State study, at 33 feet away, there were some concentrations that were um, something that would indicate risk, um, but 33 feet away was as far away as they measured. There may be some other information out there that the, the public health department or others may be able to share with us, and we'll try to look into some of that, but at this point, we, we, I have not seen, and we looked into this for some of the other manure irrigation information, uh, a concern where it has moved farther downwind, but I don't want to negate it completely. But um, at this point, I wouldn't put it as a huge concern for people living, unless your house is very close to the manure storage pit, right? So in those instances where you're located near there, you, you may want to be careful, particularly when agitating, right? Just be aware of what's happening when you're agitating, particularly in the first few hours of agitation. Um, and also there are regulations about how, how close your house can even be to a manure pit. Um, but we're hoping to get to get you some more information on that when we can. So as you, you gain, there's, there's a lot of information here. Um, there's still some things that we have um, on our list of things to look into, some information. Um, we're reaching out to colleagues in a lot of different areas and other parts of, of the country, just being sure we can get the best information. I did want to make you guys um, aware of some upcoming programs. For some of you that may be looking um, to understand OSHA and some requirements for, it happens that this coming Monday, I have a webinar that I'm doing with Mary Bauer, our OSHA compliance assistants from the Eau Claire office on their record keeping requirements and their new changes. So you can just send me an email saying OSHA webinar and I'll be getting information out. Those that with the, the professional nutrient applicators of Wisconsin and other nutrient applicators, you're familiar with our TRIO conference, will be up updating some of the information that we include in this topic um, in our, our regular training there, our level one. And then with the Midwest Manure Summit coming up in February, um, Becky has an anaerobic digester program and we've had some discussion of whether at that pre-summit we offer a confined space training um, for manure storage and handling. And then Wisconsin is back to hosting the North American Manure Expo August 22nd um, through the 23rd in Arlington. So be looking for information on that. So we, we greatly appreciate that everyone took time today um, to participate in this training. I rem remind you that if you are an employer and you've had employees listening to this recording, be sure to, to document that and keep it as part of your training programs. Um, we also appreciate eExtension um, and helping us um, with the delivery of this webinar and reaching out. Um, I think I can say on behalf of John, Becky, Jeff, Kevin, and myself, um, thank you. And we will, we will be getting out how to access the recording and some of these other informations that we have. Kevin, any last words? No, just to repeat again, thank you very much for uh, being a part of the program today. And if you have questions, don't hesitate to outreach to us or to extension specialists in your own state. And just real quick, I'll say uh, I, I just put a link in chat for the Learn event. Uh, there'll be a recording available there. And then, um, I, again, I don't know if uh, there'll be a follow-up with regard to an, an email to folks that registered, but I'm sure if there is, there, uh, there'll be a link to the recording there, but you can uh, go visit this Learn event and uh, a recording will be available there within a couple of, day of days. Anything else, folks? And there are two links there. They're not the same one. The first one you put up is the Midwest Manure Summit. The next one is the uh, learn.extension.org, which will be one of the places where information about this webinar will be posted. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, okay. everyone. Have a good Thanks, day. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.